How do you say thank you properly to someone who has given you a great gift? Well, you may tell them thank you. You may write them a card. You may seek to do something for them to show your appreciation. You may even buy them a gift. You know, we have a number of ways in order, order for us to show our appreciation to someone. When someone does something nice for us, we express our gratitude. We express our thankfulness to them. We know how to express our thankfulness to one another, but how do we express our gratitude and our thankfulness to the Lord? We can't send him a thank you card. You can't buy him a gift card to Olive Garden. That doesn't work. So how is it that we are to show our gratitude for the one who has given us everything, the one who has given us life? How can we appropriately show our thanks to the one who died in our place, to the one who bore our sins upon himself, to the one who has given us forgiveness and the guarantee of eternal life? How should we show our gratitude to the Lord Jesus for all that he has done for us. Well, as we know, this Thursday is Thanksgiving, a day that is set aside for the giving of thanks. It is a reminder to all of us that we are those who are to be thankful to the Lord. Now, while we know that to be true, it is certainly good to be reminded of it on a regular basis, because as we all know, it's far too easy to slip into our normal routines and fail to express our gratitude, our thanksgiving to the Lord as we ought. So we're going to pause from our study through the book of Romans this morning and look at a passage that explains the proper way for us to express our gratitude to the Lord. And what we see in our passage this morning is that while it is important to say the words, thank you, expressing our thanks to the Lord goes beyond mere words. So please turn with me to Psalm 100. I'll be looking at Psalm 100 this morning. As we begin with Psalm 100, you might notice the heading for the psalm. It says, a psalm for thanksgiving. Now, this was written long before the American holiday of Thanksgiving. These words were written nearly 3,000 years ago. But this psalm was written to encourage, to direct God's people in how it is that we are to give thanks to the Lord. This psalm shows us how to properly express our gratitude and our thanksgiving to the King. Now, we're going to read the entire psalm first, and then we're going to go back and analyze it verse by verse. Now, as I read Psalm 100... See if you can identify the seven commands that are given to us here. There are seven commands given to us in these five verses for how it is that we are to properly express our gratitude to the Lord. And this is the way the Lord desires that we show our thankfulness to Him. We read this in Psalm 100. It's a psalm for thanksgiving. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and His faithfulness to all generations. Now, did you catch the seven commands? We are to shout. We are to serve, we are to come, we are to know, we are to enter, we're to give thanks, and we're to bless His name. Now we're going to look at each of these commands in detail this morning, because they are incredibly important for us to know and then to seek to apply to our daily life. This is the way that we are called upon to express our gratitude to the Lord for all He is and for all He has done for us. But before we examine each of these seven, I want us to look at the last verse of this psalm. Because Psalm 5, or verse 5 provides us with the reasons that we are to give our thanks in the first place to the Lord. Look at verse 5 again. We're told, For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. Now, there are three truths told to us in this verse about who God is. They are foundational truths. They really form the basis for our thanksgiving. These are the reasons that we are to give thanks to the Lord at all times. And first we are told the simple statement, the Lord is good. The Hebrew word translated good there is tov. It means good. It means the opposite of evil. It is a word that describes what is pleasing, what is beautiful, what is good. The statement declares that God is good. And that means He is good in everything that He does. He can never do anything that is even remotely bad or remotely evil because He is good. That means everything He does is good. And because God is good, He should be thanked and praised on a continual basis. 
You know, that simple statement is one of the most important and central truths to understand about who God is and how He has revealed Himself to us in the Scripture. We often do not understand why God allows certain things to happen in our lives. But if we grasp this truth, that He is a good God, then there is comfort even when things don't make sense. You know, if God was not a good God, then life would be pretty bleak because we would be under the hand of an almighty, all-sovereign God who could decide one day to be evil or mean or sadistic. But that's not who He is. Our God is good. The Bible promises us this is a core characteristic of who God is. And so that we have the assurance that God will always be good. He will never be evil. He is good all the time. He is good when life makes sense. He is still good when life doesn't make sense. And we can always give thanks no matter what circumstance we might find ourselves in because it doesn't change the characteristic of who God is. God is good. A woman by the name of Corey Ten Boom was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps. Some of you might be familiar with her account. She and her family were caught trying to save the Jews from the Nazi persecution. And so she and her sister were sent to the concentration camps. And she wrote this. Often I have heard people say, how good God is. We prayed it would not rain for our church picnic and look at the lovely weather. Yes, God is good when He sends good weather. But God was also good when He allowed my sister Betsy to starve to death before my eyes in a German concentration camp. Those are rather powerful words shared by a woman who certainly saw her share of tragedy and heartache in her life. And yet she could still affirm with full conviction God is good and He is good all the time. She understood that reality in the core of her being. She never fully understood, nor could anybody, why her sister died and she did not. But she took great comfort in the fact that God is always good, always good, no matter what. The death of her sister was certainly not a good event. That was a horrible event. That was an evil event. But God remained good no matter what circumstance we might be going through. God is good when He experienced blessing, and He is still good in the midst of our tragedy. And that's what the psalmist is proclaiming here in this psalm of thanksgiving. God is good no matter our circumstance. And so His goodness, who He is, is reason for us to give thanks to Him each and every day, no matter what we might be facing. Second, we are told that God's loving kindness is everlasting. The Hebrew word for loving kindness is chesed. It means loyal love or covenantal love. It's a love and a devotion that's based upon a relationship. It's the word used throughout the Old Testament to describe God's special love that He has for His own people. His unconditional, never-ending love. This word describes His mercy, that which He cares for and how He takes care of His own. And we are reminded that God's love, His loyal love, His unconditional love, it has no end. It is everlasting. And certainly that is reason to give Him thanks this morning because His love has no end. That means no matter what comes, the truth is God loves us. No matter how much we fall, no matter how many times we stumble, no matter how much we mess up, or no matter how great we think we are, God's love is everlasting and His love is always upon us. Certainly God displayed the extent of His great love for us through the cross, where God the Father sent God the Son in love for us. And Jesus loved us so that He was willing to die for us. We never need wonder, does God really love me? Because all we need to do is look at the cross, and that is the evidence, the testimony of all time, that God's love is everlasting. And no matter what circumstance you might find yourself in this morning, you need to know the truth that God's love is everlasting. And that is reason indeed to give Him thanks. No, for every morning and every evening, because His love is everlasting. And we can thank Him continually that His love has no end. We can thank Him that His love has been poured upon us through the gift of the Jesus Christ. And even when life doesn't make sense, we know God's love is everlasting. Third, we're told that God's faithfulness is to all generations. The Hebrew word that's used here is emuna. It means faithfulness, trustworthy, dependable. That's who the Lord is. The Lord is faithful. He is always honest. He is always dependable. He always keeps His word. He does not change His mind like we humans do. He always keeps His promises. He never has an excuse for not doing something He said He was going to do. That is why we can trust that what we learn about Him from the Scriptures is true. The Bible tells us He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is faithful. 
No matter how much things in the world change around us, his character does not change. And that is cause for thanksgiving that he is faithful from generation to generation to all. These three character traits of our Lord are the reason that we are to give him thanks. They are true. No matter how good our life might be or how bad our life might be, this is the truth of who God is. And this forms the basis of why we can always give thanks for who he is. Now, the rest of the psalm, verses 1 through 4, show us how it is that we are to express our gratitude properly. So we're going to look at each of the seven directions given to us for how it is that we are to express thanks. There are seven commands, seven ways that we are called upon to show our gratitude to the Lord. And the first is found up in verse 1, where we are told to shout to the Lord. Psalm 100, verse 1. A psalm for thanksgiving. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Now, this is a rather interesting way for a psalm on Thanksgiving to begin, with a command, and we're commanded to shout joyfully to the Lord. Now, that phrase, shout joyfully, is all one word in the Hebrew. It's ruha. It literally means to signal with a loud noise. It quite literally means to split the ear with a shout of alarm or a shout of joy. The term was used to describe blowing a horn, blowing an alarm when the city was being attacked. It was used to describe the loud shouts of excitement that a victorious army would make after a battle. It means to make a very loud and a very joyful, a ruckus noise even. See, we see here that Thanksgiving is not something that's just to be done in quiet solitude. We are commanded to be vocal in our giving of thanks to the Lord. This term, ruha, is used over 20 times in the Psalms. Clearly, it's something that we are to do. It describes the manner in which we are to proclaim our praise and thanks to the Lord. For example, it's used in Psalm 47.1. Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with a voice of joy. See, we are told to be loud, to be joyful in our giving of thanks. And we are continually commanded in the Psalms to shout to the Lord joyfully. And so it's very clear that this is one of the ways that the Lord desires that we express our gratitude to Him. We are to make a loud and a joyful sound. Now... Clearly, this does not mean that we are to shout at the top of our lungs every time we talk about him. That's not what it means. That would be rather irritating, and it would also wear out our voices. That's not what it means to shout at the top of our lungs. The idea behind this word is that we are to be vocal, we are to be joyful in our giving of praise. We should really be just as excited about our public proclamation of who God is and his praise as if we had just won a great victory in battle or our team won the Super Bowl. You know, we know how to get excited. We know how to be joyful. We get excited and joyful at sporting events and concerts. And yet somehow we just lose that when we come to church sometimes. Sometimes we think that when we come to church, we must be very solemn and serious and quiet. I think oftentimes we forget the command that's repeated often is shout joyfully to the Lord. You know, sometimes we think that the more quiet and more solemn a service, the more worshipful it is. And certainly there is time for quiet reflection. But over and over and over again, we're commanded to shout joyfully to the Lord. That means to be loud, to be joyful in our proclamation of praise to Him. It doesn't say whisper to the Lord. It says shout to the Lord. And according to the psalmist, worship should most often be that which is joyful and celebratory. Now, certainly shouting to the Lord does not mean in any way that we are out of control in our worship service. It does not mean that we should be disrespectful or dishonoring to Him. We're told very clearly in 1 Corinthians that everything must be done in order because we're worshiping a God who is order. We are told to worship in a respectful manner to our God. But we should never forget that in our honoring and respecting of Him, we are to be joyful in the way in which we express our praise. We aren't to come together with very long and serious faces and talk about, how good God is, how wonderful He is. That's not what we're supposed to do. There should be emotion and passion when we say those words. There should be an excitement that when we say God is good, we mean it from within, and it's shared by the way in which we express that. If we want to express our thanks the way He desires, then we should do it with a loud and a joyful voice. Now, why should we shout to the Lord? We're told in verse 5. In fact, please, read it with me. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. This is the reason we are called upon to shout to the Lord. Because He is good. Because He is loving. Because He is faithful. Now back up in verse 2, we're given a second command. And that is we're called upon to serve the Lord. Look at verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. 
We are commanded to serve Him with gladness. We show our love and our appreciation to Him through our service. The Hebrew word that's used here is avad. It means to work or to labor, but specifically to expend considerable energy and intensity in a task. It means to do it with all that you are. The word was often used to describe military service. It means to work for someone else, but to do it with great intensity, with great heart. Gladness is the Hebrew word simcha. It means joy or gladness. It means to have a sense of delight, of pure joy, of happiness and cheerfulness. And so then, with these two words together, we are commanded to serve with all our energy, with all our heart, and to do it with gladness. To serve with a deep sense of happiness, even excitement. Understanding that it is a great privilege to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and there should be joy in our hearts as we serve Him. Now we should notice it's not just service that pleases him. It never is. It's never just about externals, but it's serving with gladness. And our service to the Lord is a way in which we show him our gratitude and our thanks for who he is. See, while words are important, so are actions. And we show the depth of our gratitude by seeking to serve the Lord with gladness. Now, what does it look like to serve the Lord with gladness? You know, too often when we talk about serving God, we think of something that we can only do within the church building. And that's often the way we think about it, that those involved in ministry, they're serving God. And serving God is something that you just do at church. Well, now certainly serving the Lord involves doing things at church, but it's much more than that. We are called to serve Him with gladness, and that's not limited to a specific location or a specific time. We are called upon to serve Him with gladness 24 hours a day, seven days a week. See, to serve God with gladness means that we are living our lives seeking to live them in obedience to His Word. It means we're seeking to do what He wants with our lives. It means we're seeking to avoid sin. We're seeking to pursue righteousness. It means we're seeking to do good towards others. It means we're seeking to live lives that are pleasing to our Lord. That's what it truly means to serve the Lord. It means to live for Him. And we ought to know that this service is not to be done begrudgingly. We are to show our thankfulness not just by serving, but by our attitude as well. God certainly wants our obedience, but He wants it with the proper attitude. And if we are failing to serve the Lord with gladness each and every day, then the reality is we're reflecting a heart that really isn't very grateful to Him. See, our service reflects our hearts. And if we're not serving Him with joy, then we're really not showing that we're very thankful for all that He has given to us. And if we desire to show our gratitude appropriately, then we must serve Him with gladness. And why is it that we are called upon to serve Him with gladness? Again, please read verse 5 with me. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. That's why we serve Him. That's why we should be serving Him with gladness. Because He is good. Because He is loving. Because His faithfulness lasts to all generations. There's a third way we see we are commanded to express our gratitude, and that is we are called upon to sing to the Lord. Look at the end of verse 2. Come before Him with joyful singing. We evidence our thankfulness by the way we come before the Lord and sing. And we are commanded here to come to the Lord with joyful singing. See, singing songs is a way in which we demonstrate our gratitude to the Lord. Singing is one of the offerings that we can bring and present before Him. See, we've got to understand that when we gather and sing songs, we don't sing for the person sitting next to us in church. We don't sing for the pleasure of anyone here. We don't sing to make our worship pastor happy. We don't do any of that. We don't sing for anyone else in this room. When we sing, we are to be singing for an audience of one. We are singing for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Our singing is an act of worship, something that we are presenting directly to Him. And when we do it with a heart of joy and a heart of thanks, it brings pleasure to our Lord. Singing joyfully communicates our thankfulness to Him. Now, I find the choice of words here very comforting because the psalmist does not say, come before Him with beautiful sounding singing. It doesn't say, come before Him with pitch perfect singing. If that were the case, I would be in trouble. I am one who is musically challenged. Perhaps a few of you are as well. But this verse doesn't say you have to come with a perfect voice. If you have a perfect voice, that's what you use. But for those of us that don't, it says come before him with joyful singing. The quality here is the heart with which we express our feelings of devotion to the Lord. It says come before him with joyful singing. And despite my own limitations, I can make a joyful sound to the Lord. So can you. 
That's what we are commanded to do. We can all sing joyfully to the Lord. Some of our voices might sound like angels, some slightly less, some a whole lot less. But that's not the point. The point is we are to sing joyfully unto Him. No matter our limitations, we can all sing joyfully if our heart is full of gratitude towards Him. And God wants us to express our gratitude to Him through singing. In fact, it's an important aspect of our spiritual life. Over and over again in the Bible, we are commanded to sing to the Lord. In fact, we see it over and over again in the Psalms. We see in heaven, that's what they're going to be doing in heaven. The angels sing. In Revelation, the saints around the throne singing. It is the natural expression of a heart that is full of gratitude to sing praise to the Lord. For those of us here who were here last Sunday night at our hymn sing, it was a great time, wasn't it, to just gather and sing songs of praise to our King. There is something very special about gathering for the sole purpose of singing songs. And when we sing joyfully, we are expressing our praise to the Lord and doing it in a way He has commanded us to express it. And we're doing it in a way that brings Him honor and joy. See, singing is a way for us to express our gratitude to Him. And that's why we spend a significant time Sunday morning singing. We don't do it merely as a time filler. We don't do it because of tradition or some sort of obligation. We sing because our Lord has told us He wants us to sing. We sing joyfully because it's the overflow of a heart that is full of gratitude to Him. And when we sing, we are obeying His Word and we are pleasing Him. Why is it that we should sing to the Lord? Verse 5, For the Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. That's why we sing to the Lord. We sing to Him because He is good. We sing to Him because His love has no end. We sing to Him because His faithfulness extends to all generations. There's a fourth way presented here in how we are to show our thankfulness. And that is we must seek to spend time with the Lord. Look at verse 3. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture. Now we are commanded here to know two things specifically about who God is and to know who we are in relationship to Him. And when we truly know these two truths, who God is and who we are, it results in a heart of gratitude. The Hebrew word used here is yada. It means to know, to be aware, to understand. And we are commanded here to know fully, to understand completely, to grasp the reality that the Lord Himself is God. The covenantal name of God is used here as it is throughout the psalm. Yahweh. It's translated Lord in all caps here. We're told Yahweh alone is God. He is the only God and we must know that simple truth. He is the one true God. He is the creator of all. And we are His creation. See, in order to properly express our thanks to the Lord, you must know who the Lord is. Otherwise, your praise is not directed to the right one. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You can't come before God unless you believe in him, unless you know the truth about him. And if you don't know who he is, then you're not coming before the one true God. Those who worship a God of their own making, those who worship a God who is described differently than we, he has revealed himself in the scripture, those who reject the reality of who Jesus Christ is, they are not worshiping the one true God. He alone is the true God. He alone is the creator of the universe. And if you don't believe He is, then it is impossible to please Him. No matter how many times you say thank you, no matter how many prayers you might offer, no matter what you might do, without faith in Him, it is impossible to please Him. Once you know who God is, you must also know who we are before Him. Notice the psalm says, We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. We must not only know who God is, we must know our place in our relationship to the one true God. We are His sheep, means He is the shepherd. We are the creation, He is our creator. We are, by humans, He is alone, divine in God. Knowing the nature of our relationship ensures that our worship is correct. For if we constantly remind ourselves that we are His sheep and He is the shepherd, then we will be submissive to Him, we will be thankful to all that He has done for us, and we will not begin to elevate ourselves higher than we ought. You know, we are described as sheep in His pasture. That's a common phrase, a common metaphor that's used in the Scripture. God's people, true believers, are often referred to as His sheep. That's not always a compliment. You know, sheep are a rather fascinating animal. They are totally dependent upon their shepherds for life. 
Sheep have no natural defenses against predators. They can't even find food on their own. If a sheep is left to itself, they will not survive. They will perish without a shepherd to care for them. A sheep is totally dependent upon someone else for everything in life. And I think that's in part why God chose this metaphor to describe our relationship with Him. We are sheep. We are dependent upon Him for everything. And if left to ourselves, we will certainly perish. But when He is our shepherd, He cares for us. He watches over us. He ensures that we are taken care of. And so we, His sheep, are to be submissive to His leadership. He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. He is the one who leads us, and we are His people. Now, the fascinating thing is only believers are identified as sheep in the Scripture. Only those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation are called sheep. They are the only ones that belong to Him. And if you are here this morning and you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, then this isn't about you. You are not one of the sheep of His pasture. But it can be. You can become a sheep that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ through repentance and placing faith in Him. And if you would like to talk to somebody about that and what that involves, please see me after the service. We are commanded in the midst of a psalm on Thanksgiving to know who God is and to know who we are in relationship to Him. The reality is to really understand, to yada, to know these truths, that takes some time. It takes some effort. See, we express our thankfulness to God by growing in our knowledge of who He is, by growing in our understanding of our relationship to Him. And that can only be done by spending quality time with the Lord in careful study of His Word, learning about Him and learning about ourselves. See, one of the ways we show our love and our gratitude to the Lord is by the amount of time and effort and study we put into knowing Him better. The more we know Him, the more we are able to love Him more fully. This is one of the reasons that we should each be reading our Bible every day. That's because the Bible is one of our primary sources of spiritual growth. The way we learn about who God is, the way we learn about who we are in relationship to Him, the way we know what He wants us to do and how He's going to lead us in our life is through the careful study and application of God's Word to our life. And the more we desire to know God, the more it reflects a grateful heart. The less we desire to know God, the less time we spend reading the Bible, the more we're really reflecting an ungrateful heart. Because if we don't care about reading the Bible, we are declaring that we're really not that interested in God. God has given us His Word. He has given us all that we can need to know about who He is and how we're to live. And if we don't care about that, we're saying we really don't care much about God. See, the amount of time and energy we spend in learning and knowing God reflects our true level of thankfulness to Him. The less time we spend in this endeavor, truly the less thankful we are. But the more thankful we are, naturally the more time we will spend. And to demonstrate our thankfulness to the Lord, we ought to be those who spend time getting to know Him better. The psalmist says, no, yada, that he is God. And that only happens through spending time in the study of the scripture. And if we are truly thankful to him, it will show by spending time with him. The more we learn, the more we spend time in God's word, really the more grateful we become because we learn to appreciate more of all that he has done for us. We grow in our understanding that he is God and we are his sheep. Why should we spend time with the Lord? Verse 5. For the Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. You're going to know this verse and be saying it all week. That's the point. <laughs> we spend time with God because He is good. That's why we seek to spend time with Him, because of who He is. He is good, He is loving, and He is faithful. There's a fifth way we're called upon to show our gratitude, and that is we must seek to worship the Lord. Worship the Lord in public. Look at verse 4. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We're commanded here to enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Now, when this was written, there was a physical temple standing in Jerusalem, and the gates and the courts were literal places. They were what you went through as you entered the temple in Jerusalem. And so this is a command to come before the Lord's presence, to do so in a public place, and do so with thanksgiving and praise. This is a command to seek to worship the Lord in a public place with other believers and proclaim His greatness. See, in the Old Testament, to go to the temple was to go to where God's presence was displayed in a very special sense. Now, God is no longer dwelling in any temple on earth. He lives within the heart of every believer. 
We no longer go to a temple in Jerusalem or anywhere else. There are no longer physical gates and courts to enter in that sense. But we still do have public places of worship. We have the gathering of the church. And I think to apply this to our day, this command would be to seek to worship the Lord in a public setting. Seek to gather with other believers to proclaim His greatness and to give Him thanks. Because the temple was not only where God's presence was, it was a public and a corporate place of worship. And so the modern equivalent would be to come to a church worship service, to do so with thanksgiving and praise in our heart, to gather publicly with other believers and praise the Lord. What we see in this is that we are to make the spending of time in a corporate and public worship a priority in our life. God wants us to come before Him on a regular basis, and He wants us to gather with other believers on a regular basis, to spend time focusing on Him, giving Him thanks and praise with other believers. We are to worship Him in public, even as they did at the temple. In fact, it's a clear indication of a heart that is full of gratitude and appreciation to the Lord. Those who are full of appreciation will seek to express that in a public forum with other believers. In fact, the reality that you are here this morning, gathered with other believers for the worship and the study of His Word, shows that you are thankful to Him. It shows that you are setting aside time out of your weekly, busy week to focus on the Lord. And that pleases Him if it's done with a grateful heart as you come before Him. You know, too often people think they really don't need to gather at church for worship. They can do it alone, at home, or in the woods even better. And certainly we can worship God wherever we are because He is not restricted to any one spot. But the psalmist declares it's important to enter His courts, to go to a public place and worship Him. It was important then, and it's important today. We can only enter His courts with praise if we go to a public place of worship. And so this command to express our gratitude is really only accomplished as we gather with other believers by praising the Lord together in a public setting. Why is it that we should seek to worship the Lord together in public? That's verse 5. <laughs> For the Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and His faithfulness to all generations. That's why we seek to worship Him, not because we get some point somewhere, not because we get some kind of public recognition. We seek to worship Him because He is good, because He is loving, and He is faithful. Sixthly, we are commanded to speak to the Lord in verse 4. Look at the end of verse 4. Give thanks to Him. We are told very simply to state our thanks directly to the Lord. We are told to vocalize our thanks and to speak directly to Him. Now, that might sound a bit basic. We're told to speak to the Lord to give Him thanks. And it is basic. But the psalmist is ensuring that we don't miss this basic truth. And we are commanded to express our thanks directly to the Lord. Because the reality is sometimes we can be thankful and we can tell everybody else how thankful we are and we forget to just stop and thank God Himself for how thankful we are for what He's done. And this is a reminder to us that we ought not do that. While it's good to tell others, in fact, we should tell others, we also need to make the time to speak to God directly and express our thanks to Him. We are to thank the Lord every day for the blessings He gives to us, for who He is and what He's done. You know, sometimes we tend to focus on the big things and we forget the small. But the psalmist says, give thanks to God. And that means give thanks to Him for everything, even the mundane things of life. We can thank Him for both the big and the small. We can thank Him for saving us from some disaster or serious situation. We can thank Him for giving us air to breathe and clothes to wear. We are to thank Him at all times in every situation. And the psalmist encourages us, give thanks to the Lord. And this is something that ought to be a normal part of our daily routine in every circumstance to give Him thanks. And why should we give Him thanks? Why should we speak directly to the Lord? Verse 5, For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. That's why we give thanks, because of who He is, because He is good, because He is loving, because He is faithful. It's the last command at the end of verse 4. And that is, we are told to speak about the Lord as well. End of verse 4. We are told, bless His name. The Hebrew word that's used here is barak. It means to bless or to speak words of praise or thanksgiving or thankfulness. That's what it means. When we talk about bless the Lord, it means we're speaking words of praise about Him, speaking about who He is. We bless the name of God by speaking of His attributes, by telling of His works, by proclaiming how great it is and how thankful we are for what He has done. To bless God is to tell others of His greatness, to speak about Him. 
And we bless His name whenever we talk about how wonderful God is and what He has done. And we are commanded here to show our gratitude by blessing His name. We do that by sharing about Him to others. See, we are to speak about the attributes of God to one another. We are to bless His name. And we can do that in a variety of manners. When we sing, we are blessing His name. When we sing of the love of God, that's blessing His name. We're talking about His attributes. When we sing about the holiness of God, we are blessing His name. When we proclaim He is God alone, we are proclaiming truth about who He is, we are blessing His name. Whenever we speak, whenever we sing about who God is, we are blessing His name. When we share the gospel with someone, we are blessing His name. When we share our testimony, when we talk about what God is doing in our life, we are blessing His name because we are sharing truth about who He is. And when we do that, we are blessing His name. And the degree to which we bless His name is the degree to which we evidence a grateful heart before Him. We are called upon here to bless His name at all times, in all circumstances. When we experience something wonderful, share it with others and bless His name. When we've been through a rough patch, but God has shown Himself faithful, we can still share that with others and bless His name. That's how we show our gratitude, by blessing the name of the Lord. We show the, our love for the Lord by telling others of how great He is. And why should we talk to anybody about the Lord? Why is it that we should bless His name? Verse 5. <laughs> for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. His faithfulness to all generations. That's why we should talk about Him. We should speak about Him. We should bless His name. Because He is a good God. Because He is a loving God. Because He is a faithful God. See, the psalmist in these short five verses is urging us to realize the character of God and then to live a life of gratitude each and every day because God is good all the time. He is loving all the time and He is faithful all the time. And these are reasons to give Him thanks all the time. And when we realize these truths, then we can live every day being thankful because while our circumstances change, these truths do not change. This is who God is. So how should we show our gratitude to the Lord? How do you give thanks to the one who has given us everything? We do so by shouting to Him. We do so by serving Him. We do so by singing songs to Him. We show our gratitude by seeking to spend time with Him, by seeking to worship Him with others. We show our gratitude by speaking to Him and by speaking about Him. The Lord is truly worthy to be thanked for all He is and all He has done for us. As we approach Thanksgiving in the week ahead, I encourage you to take the time to reflect upon Psalm 100. Ensure that you are showing your gratitude in the proper manner to the one who has given you everything. May we be thankful every day on Thanksgiving, certainly, but every day of the year. And may we continually give thanks to our King for the gift of life that He has given us. For He is good, His loving kindness is everlasting, and He is faithful to all generations. Let's pray.